Okay. Uh, this afternoon we have with us Waylon Hamilton. Uh, Pam was our first basketball coach, first athletic director, one of the first faculty members here. Uh, I ran into him a, a few months ago at Sellers Restaurant. Uh, one more, one Sunday, the week after the Masters tournament, he had a green jacket on. I thought he had won the Masters. He's one of the finest golfers around. But what I have asked him to do is come in and talk about his experiences in World War II as an American pilot. Uh, he flew 361 combat missions, 681 combat hours, ferrying supplies in the China Burma India theater. Uh, they also evacuated wounded, did a whole variety of other things in that theater. He has been awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross with one cluster, the Air Medal with three clusters, the American Theater Ribbon, the Asiatic Pacific Theater Ribbon with two stars, the Victory Medal. Uh, from China, he's won the War Memorial Medal. Uh, the Chinese Air Force pilot wings. Uh, he retired from the reserves in 1959, the rank of captain. Uh, when we talk about the hump, China, Burma, India, you're essentially flying over the mountain ranges uh, into some of the most difficult territory, difficult terrain in the Asian theater. Uh, so what I'm going to do is turn it over to him. I've asked him to give you about a half hour, 40 minute presentation and then open up the questions and answers. He's far more experienced in this theater than I am, so let me turn it over to him. Make a, make a pretty long list after what 
but uh, so I, uh, I I quickly uh, weighed a few things and I said, "My goodness, these people have have studied about World War II some. They they've certainly been uh, exposed to movies, uh, to documentaries, to even now on the web you can get uh, you can almost any battle or any." any theater war in World War II and before other wars, you can pick up some information. Uh, the information out there now is, is just great. So, and there are many, many stories have been, have been told and written about exploits in various phases of, of World War II, as you know. But as I took a, briefly on the background, uh, prologue to war certainly uh, started in, in, uh, in my theater war, the CBI theater, when uh, J Japan's expansion into Manchuria, right down through China, in the early 30s and the, and the, and the late 30s, and with Chiang Kai-shek as their leader and Gao Tai-sung finally joining hands with him, and uh, a few of the other provincial uh, warlords there got together to try to stem the tide of, uh, of Japan, and they did not do it very successfully, as you know. Uh, they they even appealed to uh, uh, uh got into the picture for for a while. Uh, General Stilwell did all through the efforts of Chiang Kai-shek lobbying in in the U.S. Uh, for help, and so we we committed some forces there early. Well, it wasn't long before Pearl Harbor occurred, and. Uh, that changed the picture a little bit because the priority now dropped pretty low as far as the aid to the Lend Lease aid to, to to China. Well, you know what the expansion uh, of the Empire of Japan went to about 20 million square miles. They had the largest influence of any empire in the history of the of the globe. They expanded all the way to Darwin, Australia, all the way to Alaska, and eventually all the way up through Burma to India. In fact, they were in India. When they were there, the, the British, the U.S., and Indian forces stopped the, the expansion. And but their expansion into the into the Burma area cut off the supply line that the U.S. had developed for China, up through Burma into Lashio and from Lashio and, and over the Burma Road to, to Kunming, a western city of China. Well, with that cut off, something had to occur. And the U.S. made a commitment to fly supplies into, into China over the the world's highest mountains, the worst weather, and the least navigational aids that you would expect. Uh, but they made a commitment and uh, they paid the price. Because at the conclusion of 45, 1945, it wasn't estimated, it was noted that there were 3,000 tactical and uh, cargo planes that were either shot down, lost through weather, pilot error, or something of that nature. Because the flying conditions were, were terrible, and the planes that they were using were the C-47 and the C-46. That C-46 plane was made right up here in Buffalo. All of them, 3,050 of them, were made there and probably Half of those were committed to the CBI theater. But these, these supplies were, were flown in at the rate of about, uh, I don't know, but uh, in 1995, I, I, or 95, pardon me, in 1945, they got up to about 78 tons a month flying in. In fact, that gave birth to the Balloon Airlift, which occurred <coughs> later on after World War. But as a low priority, 
other planes did not arrive in that scene until quite a bit, uh, quite a bit later. Um, B-24s, uh, uh, a, a, a medium, or a map, not a bomb, but a, a, a bomber that was used in Europe but it was converted to a cargo plane. So with all these supplies going in there now, they had to keep China in the war. And because they were looking long range <coughs> and said they're going to have to have bases in China with which to attack Japan when the time came. Well, as, as time went on, uh, uh, the, uh, the commitment seemed to elevate a bit when the European theater started to come down a little bit. As you know, the uh, GE Day was uh, around May of 45. The B, BJ Day was quite a bit, a few, a few months later than that. But uh, soon after, soon after the the uh, war treated in Europe, we got a lot more help over in the, in the Far East. And the, the uh, I get thinking about some things that uh, that uh, I should preface a little bit beforehand is that where did I fit into all this program? That's what I'm here for. Uh, what I've been telling you is probably just rehashed material which you've already gone over, but, but, but as that cadet that went through training in 1942 and 43, I, like all young men, uh, would like to have gotten into fighters of some kind, but they needed multi-engine pilots because of what they were going to do in, in the Far East. Uh, well, uh, going through a, a program of about, I don't know, it took about 11 or 12 months to get, to get through a, a, a program and that was accelerated with your combat crew training. I was uh, uh, in, in uh, Missouri with our combat crew training and, and in a C-47 cargo plane. <coughs> Carried about six or seven thousand thousand payload. We were after completing our training there. We we went on into Fort Wayne, Indiana, which was called a staging area. That's the last stop before you head over. We we thought we were going to get to go to Europe and get in on the on the invasion, but we heard uh, rumors that that was about to occur, but uh, we didn't. We got orders to, to, to go to the Far East. And believe me, uh, if, if you want to know excitement that went through a crew, it's when at the staging area, as a pilot of one of the crew crews there, called into the operations officer there, and he said, uh, I thought we were in for some kind of trouble, but he said, he says, I'm issuing you this new airplane. He says, I want you to get it over to overseas. Yeah, we, we joked a little bit, but that's what he did. When he, he hands you an order that issues you a, a brand new airplane, and say, you're to fly this over, uh, you get a little sh shaken up. But within three days, we, we uh, became accustomed to, to all the, all the uh, pre-flight work and so on, and then we took off and headed for, for South America. We were going the southern route because it happened to be in January when we pulled up Fort Wayne, Indiana. So we moved from there to, to uh, Puerto Rico, from Puerto Rico into, into British Guiana, from British Guiana into Natal, Brazil, from Natal, Brazil, across the South Atlantic, into across the Gold Coast, and from there across the Sahara Desert, from there in the Karachi, India, from there on down to our, our base in, in uh, Chittagong, south of Calcutta. 
very day that we got in there, it took about, oh, I'd say about 10, 9 or 10 days, about 90 flying hours. When I arrived there, the uh, CO said, we're glad to see you. And uh, they had been over there for about three or four months at the time. This was in just in, in January of 45. And uh, he said, we're also happy to see you. And he says, uh, we need that airplane because we've lost two or three of them. We have a squadron of 23 or 24 planes, and uh, we lost three of them already, uh, mostly due to weather. One uh, cracked up on takeoff. Well, so this was a, sta a, a stage in the, in, the, in the operation that I became involved in. The very next day, I was assigned to a, to a, a captain, and we, were, we flew a mission in the Mission Hall, which is in northern Burma. Uh, landed on a dirt strip and unloaded uh, our, our, our supplies and headed back over. It took about two hours to get there, another two hours back, and then we had to go again. But what we did there uh, at the start was to take, take in all war material supplies. In other words, we were carrying ammo, we were playing, uh, carrying dynamite, we were carrying, carrying foodstuffs, medical supplies, everything that, that uh, new, new clothing and things for, for the people on the front edge of the, of the fighting. And we were supplying, can you imagine now, we're supplying Indian Army, we're supplying Chinese, and we're supplying British, and we're supplying some Americans too. The Americans had had full commitment in that area yet. So coming back, we would uh, we would bring uh, evacuate wounded, as you might expect. We were bringing back people that were sick. We were bringing back uh, spare parts so they could use to to repair planes and so on back. And we were bringing back Japanese prisoners of war. Not too many of those. Back then, we, we only brought back about, about three or four loads. You can carry about 28 or 29 of them in these C-47s. And we asked uh, one of the British uh, guards uh, why we didn't have more up there, because our, our troops were beginning to push Japan the, the enemy down toward Rangoon and, and out. He said most of them will fight to the, to the very end or they might even commit Harry Carey and not, not be captured. They were taught uh, the worst uh, fighting group of any, any army in the, in the world at the time, I guess. They were, they were ruthless. I hate to say that, but uh, that's the way some, they almost acted like uh, animals. Well, the uh, Japanese Air Force was practically neutralized by the time I got there. But believe me, before that, they really harassed the, the, the country uh, over there. And some of the worst conditions of all of these people that were on the ground and went through those uh, troops that I just mentioned about that we were supplying. There's, for instance, there's two, 375 inches of rain per year that happened in the monsoons. Uh, I mentioned the monsoons. Some of you know what it means. It means that every day for about four months, four or five months, it rains. And sometimes it'll rain two hours, sometimes it'll rain a lot longer. What really happens, uh, meteorologically speaking, is that during the day, over the mountains, 10,000, 12,000 uh, chin hills there, the air heats by the hot sun. You know, you're in the tropic of uh, cancer here, but you're, you're, you're uh, pretty far south. And the air heats and then it starts to rise. And when it rises, in comes off the Bay of Congo and the Indian Ocean, warm, hot, moist air. And it hits the mountains and starts to rise. And when the, when the Moist air rises, it condenses, 
and you have some form of rain. Thunderheads, cumulative, big cumulative, thunderheads, heads there and there. So it rains every day. So when we would take off in the morning, 3.30 or 4 o'clock in the morning, the, the, the planes had been loaded the night before. The, uh, the conditions on takeoff were great. Clear, nice takeoff in the head east into the sun. Over the mountains and we get over there and have a, might be on a landing load, it might be on a drop mission of some kind. And then we would we would head back. Remember I said about two hours over, depending on what part of Burma you were going to, whether it was two hours, two hours and a half, or three hours. On your way back, we would run into the, the rainstorm, the big cumulonimbus clouds that you had to pick your way through and fight your way through to, to get out. Sometimes it, the uh, altimeter, which was a pressure instrument, in other words, higher up you go, the needle goes up with you. The lower you go, it was a pressure instrument. So our, our planes would fluctuate going through this storm as much as three to 500, 500 feet. And you would think you'd be flying level because the updrafts would take you up, you'd go up 500 more, and then pretty soon someone would bring you down. And it took both, both the pilot and co-pilot on the yoke or on the cup to hold that, that airplane somewhat level so you could bring your way through. That's where we lost some planes more than we did uh, from enemy aircraft and enemy. But uh, I can remember one incident we've been on a drop mission. They package up all the all the cargo that we're going to drop out on a DC, a drop zone, in the jungle. Okay, you've seen these pictures and movies where they're doing it. That's what it was like. They would package all these things up and make nice bungs so that when they hit the ground, they, they wouldn't bust open. Well, they would they would carry ammo that way, but they separate it out pretty good, and uh, they would they would carry uh, uh, all all material necessary for the war. And uh, we went over this drop zone. When you go over the drop zone, you get in over the jungle, probably about 50 to 60, 70 feet above the above the treetops. And you go over and you slow your plane down with flaps and increase the uh, manifold pressure and slow the plane down but not slow enough to have it stall because you know if you if you slow your airplane down or if you will know or you, it'll stall out the engine will stall and bump you're done but so you had to hit a nice nice uh, nice speed and, and hit the buzzer and out the walk <coughs> back in would kick out the material you make your passes six or seven or eight of them and then head back get back home but uh, occasionally the Japanese would catch our, our radio signal or a, a blinker signal that we'd have from the ground and uh, they would uh, try to attract American planes toward another section of the jungle if your coordinates were wrong when you, when you figured out where you were going and try to get you to drop the, the materials in their area. Happened a few times. Fortunately, we didn't think it ever happened to us. But we never really know. But, but uh, uh, a couple times coming back through those thunderheads after being over the DC about an hour and two hours over, and we're, we're, we're about an hour and a half, two hours out of uh, home base, uh, picking our way through, flying on AI, I mean actual instruments. All you can see is the, your wingtips. That's about all. And you can see it flop around a little bit in the, in the, in the storm. And, but, so you keep flying that way, and you know you can't start letting down before you fly at least an hour and a half, two hours, uh, 275 heading back, back to the west. Well, we break out, we decide we've got to, we're getting a little low on fuel, we decide we've got to let down pretty soon. And we let down, and um, we didn't want to going farther because we could see that there's there's still mountains there. We're not we're not all the way over. We keep going and we move farther and let down and we break out over the water now we let down we break out over the water about five hundred feet. 
make 180 degrees and head back through the rainstorm and hit the coast and, and find an all-weather strip and land on it and get out and uh, kiss, the, kiss the, the ground uh, that you made at that time. Well, it happened frequently and all, all pilots had these experiences. As I say, some of them uh, unfortunately didn't make it. They let down through the clouds and, and there had to be peaks, peaks in the clouds. But some of these experiences that we, we had uh, are, are pretty riveting because we, we never got too close to our, our fellow pilots and crews and our, our aerial engineer too because every now and then one would come up missing and uh, he made it to. And, you know, a friend uh, got too close, uh, it was pretty, pretty tough on you, but, uh, but we kept, uh, kept plugging away, as they say, and pretty soon we transitioned into C-46s. Our C-47s became a little bit obsolete now, because now we knew what, were, what was coming. The, the enemy had been pushed down outside of Rangoon, south, we knew that we were going to join the other pilots and start flying into China. So we got into a transition, a couple hours flying time into a, to a C-46, the one that was made up in Russia. Now we, we fly that to, from uh, Chittagong, about 600 mile flight into Hunming, China, over the hump, they say. The, they call it the hump because of all the mountains that were over there. And we moved outfits now Troops, outfits, I say, different different groups, uh, support groups, into, into China. We're, we're setting up bases now in China. This is in 45, 1945. And uh, B-29s will begin to be moved into the area. Uh, that's the large super port, that the largest bomber that we had. And uh, they were being moved into the area, and, and new airfields were being built. In, in China, but they were not being built like they built them around the U.S. The U.S. They were being built like coolies. A hundred thousand of them working on 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 a runway, six thousand foot runways to to take these B-29s in and uh, take other planes and other other tactical air air. Well. We could we could almost see what was coming by moving into western western China. Uh, remember now, China is practically all occupied by by the Japanese anyway, and, and we, our fighting forces were beginning to get a hold on them there too, as well as around the around that huge empire they built into the <coughs> Netherlands and into the Philippines and so on. But you could see what was coming that we were going to start attacking Japan from the air from China, not from the, from the Marianas and from the Wake Island and from the, the carriers from the Pacific all the time. Sure, we were coming in from there too. And then all at once in, in August 6th, to be exact, the atom bomb was, was dropped. And that changed the whole complex of the war, as you know. Another bomb two days later on Nagasaki, 100,000 or more people annihilated. A lot of people didn't think it was the right thing to do, but they said it probably saved about one million to two million Allied soldiers by dropping the bomb and not having to invade Japan as a whole because they were concentrating all their, their forces back there. And from then on, we were. In fact, a lot, of the, a lot of the forces in China didn't even know that the bomb had been dropped. Because they were still fighting there after, after that bomb had dropped and they had surrendered, you know, you know, September 2nd on the Missouri to MacArthur and all his, his uh, other generals and naval generals were there. But, uh, so we still had to be a little careful. We had pamphlets that were printed up. We didn't have them. We were given pamphlets. And we were to drop pamphlets indicating in the concentration camps and into other 
other uh, areas of fighting, that the war was over. And some of these uh, Japanese forces didn't think that was true. So they kept on fighting anyway. And uh, but it soon got, they soon got the word because uh, some of the information is coming now from the Japanese generals that have surrendered and so on. So then we thought, boy, we're going to get to go home now. And uh, not so, because remember Roosevelt had passed away and the commitment to helping China was, was still in the minds of many of our people in the U.S. government. And they said, give uh, uh, Chiang Kai-shek the airplanes that you're flying, but before you do, fly all his troops that he wants to be flown up north into Peking. It's Beijing now. And so our outfits, plus others, flew over 150,000 Chinese nationalist troops into Peking. Peking. And then we got to take some of our own boys out, fly them into Shanghai, and uh, they got to go home. And then pretty soon, in, in December of 45, we got to move our own outfits in and uh, turn our ships over to, uh, to some of the Chinese nationalists. Uh, pilots, and uh, they were become pretty good pilots too now because they've been flying with the U.S. pilots there, and, uh, and uh, soon after that, uh, we boarded ships and, and headed for Seattle. So uh, that's kind of a uh, thumbnail sketch, certainly, of uh, what uh, I went through and what hundreds and hundreds of other pilots went through too, unfortunately. Some of them didn't make it back, as we all know. And, uh, and if, if you stop and always say you're one of the lucky ones that, uh, that made it through, and uh, we still think that that was, that was the way it was meant to be. And since uh, uh, mustering out and everything, and just recently, uh, 1983 or four. I joined what they call the Hump Pilots Association. That's any anyone who had anything to do with flying the Hump. And uh, that group were five or, five or eight thousand members. It's now shrunk down to less than less than four. And you know why? Because because uh, all the boys are passing on to their great reward. But it, it's been a it's been a real pleasure being being in this group because a lot of the fellows I flew with, when we have a reunion, we get to see them again. And all the stories that come out now, maybe they come out before, maybe not, but uh, they still uh, talk a lot about uh, uh, the good old lady luck that flew with us and our other boys that didn't, didn't make it. But before I finish here, I did bring along a couple of things that you might be interested in to get off the topic a little bit. These are the kind of things that we had sewn on the inside of our jackets. These are mine. They're from way back. This one says uh, that I am an American flyer. Uh, my country will reward you greatly if you will, if you will uh, in, in various dialects too, uh, if you will get them to uh, uh, friendly, friendly people and get them back. My country will reward you. So that's the things that we wore on the inside in about six or eight dialects. The dialects of the Chinwins, the Naga, uh, the Hill, the Naga Hills, there, there are a bunch of headhunters there, they said. And we also had a had a, uh, a map in Burma that if we were forced down in any way, we might be able to get out. This will not fade, but, 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 no, but, uh, but there are uh, escape routes here, and and it's Upper Burma, Lower Burma, Lower Burma on one side, and Upper Burma on the other. And uh, it's, it's uh, one that you can carry pretty, pretty tight when you hold it up to it. And use it. Unfortunately, I didn't ever have to use that. And this, I got off a, a limey uh, captain. Uh, he had uh, said he got it off a, a dead uh, colonel in the, in the Japanese uh, army. And uh, I, you know, Ted Ashizawa, you remember yes. Paul? Ted, uh, Ted uh, is a Japanese-American born. Uh, uh, 
his folks site or might have been born in Japan. Well, his parents were born in Japan. That's right. Uh, a number of his uncles fought with the 442nd Nice Battalion in Germany in World War II. Yes, and uh, anyway, uh, he was a music professor here for a number of years. Uh, and uh, I brought this out to him and asked him, what's this all this writing and scratching on here? He said, that, he, uh, he says the names of every one of this uh, captain's squad or regiment or whatever rank that it and of all his uh, men in his uh, in his group, and again uh, uh, he carried it with him. And, and, uh, and uh, this Limey, uh, he gave this to me for, believe it or not, two packs of cigarettes. He must have had others of them too. But but anyway, that was quite a quite. A, I I did have an idea of bringing uh, a Japanese samurai. Sword, have you ever, ever heard of that? Uh, Japanese. Uh, all the officers carried a, a huge saber, and uh, it was used too uh, as, a, as a weapon. And uh, I got one of those over one of the, one of the junk piles in the at the time going back. I also got a, a, uh, a rifle and sent it to my uncle in Webster, New York, who, who was uh, in the American Legion there. And uh, but I. I thought maybe he'd keep it as a souvenir, but he didn't. He, he uh, gave it to the American He had to send it back in two parts. You know. I sent the stock in one, and, and, the, and the, the bayonet uh, I kept, though. I still have that at home. But uh, anyway, well, uh, it's been great here. I know I've, I've jumped around a little bit. When I get, get talking about these things, it, uh, it, gets, uh, it gets a little bit uh, I get a little bit dry in the mouth. Don't, don't get out from behind her yet. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, uh, questions for you. I, oh, sure, questions. But uh, it, it's kind of tear jerky a little bit uh, when you start thinking, why me? Why was I so lucky? And here are these guys I flew with, a lot of them didn't make it. And, uh, I, sh I should tell them, uh, Tara Shizawa had done a video for me of the term of the Japanese about 20 years ago, <clears throat> we did an update on it about uh, 10 years ago. The only problem is our illustrious media department, somebody in there decided to erase the original video, which leaves me with a, a, a follow-up to it, which only makes sense if you have the original, and we can't duplicate the original. I'm hoping that somebody is right enough that when we get all these done, they won't win and erase them all. They're about to throw them out. There's, there's a lot written on the on the home, and I caught up on those. One of them is called the Skyway to Hell because uh, of all the, the tough flying conditions. The Japanese did harass them early when they were flying the home because they were in charge. But after they lost charge, the, the, Difficulty in flying conditions. You didn't have the, the navigation aids that you have today, either, or the planes that you had. Uh, if you're talking about flying over the Himalayas, uh, Everest is over 29,000 feet. There are a lot of other mountains in that range that are 20 to 29,000 feet. And you figure what, what it's like, how cold it has to be flying over the top of those things, or even trying to dodge in and out of them. We ever shot at him? Pardon me. Were you shot at? Yes, yes, but small arm fire. That brings up one point maybe people listen to me enough, I guess. But anyway, I can recall taking off from a, a dirt strip. Here we landed, unloaded, and it was a limey strip. Limeys, you know, we're talking about the British. Uh, they're good bunch, so we, we enjoyed being with them. And anyway, uh, we were taking off. We weren't taking off yet. We unloaded. There were about five other ships on the on the strip. And all at once we heard a loudspeaker. It was a limey talk. He says, get these blasted planes off the strip. No one's trouble. And uh, just about that time, we there's a, a few uh, mortars and a few uh, shells being lobbed into the strip. Because what had happened, the Japanese had been sheltered away from the strip during the day fighting. And they infiltrated during the night. Now they waited until the ships were on the strip, unloading, and 
they start lobbing in some shells. Well, boy, you think we didn't scramble to get on there, out there then. Jumping in our planes, revving up. You're supposed to rev up and, and check out the mag thing before you take off. We had no time for that. We just revved them up, revved them up, and just hit the, hit the runway. These are twin engine cargo planes now. They're not fighters. We stagger down in the, in the and these mortars going off near the near the strip, I can recall. We just got airborne, just lifted our gear up, and one hit on the end of the end of the runway, and it rocked the ship like this. And we thought we were going in for sure. Fortunately, the other plane, one plane was hit on the strip, but the other five got out too. And that was a that was a close one too. And, and do you think that uh, you don't perspire and sweat? and something like that. Well, you know, these fighter pilots gone through it all the time, but we went through it too. <laughs> because uh, if, we, if we didn't get there when we did, we might have been, we might have been lost, yeah. But that was a, any, any other questions here that you might Questions from you people. I might tell you that we're taking, bringing back these prisoners of war is a strange thing too. They, all they had on, the Limeys had them stripped of their clothing and some little jockey shorts, that's all. And, uh, and he said, that's the best way to do it, he said, because they, you know they haven't got any weapons on them, they said. And uh, we thought maybe they'd be guards around there. One Limey with a machine gun with them as he, he, he uh, saw that they got into the, into the aircraft. And, and he, a couple of them being carried because they were wounded. They didn't have much use for them. I, I thought that because uh, they, 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 they hated them. Because of all the atrocities that, that it is said that when uh, the Japanese went through, went through uh, Manchuria and out through China there, and six million Chinese were killed by the, the Japanese on their march through China there. And a lot of those people were just peasants, farmers. They weren't, uh, they weren't fighting forces. You know. Of course, they did a lot of other destruction other places, too. But, uh, but, uh, any other, do you have any questions at all that I might be able to? Our instrument flying was, uh, was uh, oh, I was just going to say that our instrument flying was uh, uh, where all you can see is just your instruments, and, you sh and they keep telling you, don't fly by the seat of your pants. That means that. If you're flying in an airplane now, a small plane, here, you you orientate yourself with your horizon, and if your if your if your horizon's there and your wings are level, you're going along the right. But once you start turning like that, the seat of your pants uh, tells you to, to, to level up a little. But you, you couldn't do that. You 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 had to go on your instruments when you were when you couldn't see out of your airplane. That told you the attitude of your airplane. Do you have a question? Yeah, um, how did you personally feel about the bombing of Hiroshima and Nakasaki? Me, uh, I thought uh, it was uh, a godsend. That's right. Because, and I saw this fellow's head now oh, over here, think of the millions of American soldiers and airmen and, uh, that were saved by doing that. If, if, if that had not occurred, there would probably uh, be two million less uh, American soldiers that made. Do you think that just one bomb would have done the same effect? Do you think it was necessary to do the second one? I don't know. Well, they, they asked them to surrender after the first one. They didn't get any results. And therefore, they, they hit Nagasaki on the next one. But uh, remember, there was a little bit of bombing going on prior to that, too. Uh, our B 49s were going to China and uh, into uh, Japan and, and hitting them. Uh, fire bombs and so on, and of course uh, Jimmy Doolittle's uh, fly off the Hornet back in '42 uh, on 25 B-25s. So medium bombers were loaded, and they they went to uh, uh, to Japan from the Hornet. All of the planes were lost, by the way, but about six of the crews got out on the 25. Just, just so you know, we fire bombed Tokyo. And the actual loss of life in Tokyo far exceeded the total loss of life of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And the reports of the heat in the center of Tokyo by the time we got through with the firebombing was probably doggone near as hot 
as yes. the, the center of the atomic blast. So it was no, you know. Yeah, they, they, we were, we were hitting them uh, pretty hard from, uh, from bases that we established in, uh, in China about that time in, in uh, 44. Uh, they, they, they sent them ultimatums to, to surrender before Truman decided to use that bomb. And they had no one great took off from Marianas. And I met the uh, co-pilot of that plane at one of the war, uh, war planes. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. He was tipped. Yeah. Any questions? You said that you had mentioned about the Japanese were carrying up for, uh, I guess, defense. Um, yeah, yeah, back at back at the home right. island. Did you ever get any information as to how, what extent they were doing? Like, did they pull no, everything what, out? Or? What they were doing is uh, they decided that their supply supply lines were too many thousands of miles. So they started pulling back a little bit, bringing them back, because they knew that the that the offense that the that the uh, allies were, were geared up for was improving, so they they pulled back, but I, I don't know how many got back to the to the island, but uh, you know what, uh, the elevator came out to the, to the Air Force, the Kimikaze planes, can you imagine a, a, a young fighter pilot uh, diving his plane into the ships uh, in, the, in the Pacific, our, our planes, and that was the last, uh, that was their last flight, and they just picked out a ship and just dove right into it. Killed himself, but that was a that was a desperate attempt to, uh, to stay off. Them. I should tell you that the Japanese were gearing their entire citizenry for defense of the islands. Uh, I, you know, had said probably two million of the Allies would have been lost. I would probably place if we had invaded Japan, probably five or six million or more Japanese would have been lost. It would have been a bloodbath. And the sad part about the whole situation is we were gearing men who had fought for two, three, four, five years in the European theater to move them into the Asian theater after they had just won in Europe. And they said, wait a minute, you know, what are we doing? You know, we won one of these. So why do we have to go to fight the other one? And then, you know, I don't think Truman had much of a choice. I think had he not dropped the bombs, we probably would have had some major rights within the military. We kept getting replacement pilots in at 45. And we had to check uh, P-51, P-38 pilots, P-47 pilots, those fighters. We had to check those pilots out in the C-46. You think we didn't have the time? Uh, because the C-46, a big lumber wagon, you know, and these fighter pilots, uh, were fast learners, but they, they had to learn that the, the uh, limitations of a C-46 are a lot different than a P-51. P-51 fighter, pursuit plane. They, but uh, it, uh, it, was, it was really... Yeah, you're probably about 300 miles an hour difference. Oh, God, yeah. But they, they, flew the, they flew the right seat, and they, they learned uh, rather rapidly to, because they had to... You see, when you, after you flew, 650 combat hours you were rotated out. Some guys were getting a little, a little, uh, a little, a little nervous, you know, because they had some harrowing experiences. And uh, in fact, one of our pilots came in uh, to the operations officer and took his wings off and put them on the desk and said, I'm through, I'm done. And he didn't explain why. He said he was in one of these big thunderheads in about uh, 14, 16,000. And he swears, he and the co-pilot swears that the C-47 he was flying did a snap roll. Snap roll means that you're going like this and it snaps all the way around and levels out again. Full 360. And uh, they checked his airplane over and they said that it was out of line quite a bit, you know, in the frame and the wings. Got it down. But, uh, well, I was he said he wasn't going to fly anymore, so they rotated him out. Came I would suggest if you did stop rolling, probably the frame of that yeah. airplane would be out of line if you did it. Especially a cargo plane. See, they you could you could fly, you could bank them around in about 
60, 60 degrees, or you could, you could dive in, they were redlined at about 270, and if you exceeded that, your wing might tear off. But, but uh, uh, you had to be a little careful to try to apply the limitations of the plane. That's for sure. But I always admire these people that fought on the ground in Burma because I never saw such conditions of uh, jungle living and uh, mud. And we had, we wore boots on it. When we'd get off sometimes, we'd get off the plane, we'd walk through the through the parking area and we'd be in, in, uh, in mud. And uh, you can imagine that uh, melting snows in the Himalayas that went down those three or four big rivers that flew out all the way to the, all the way to the, to the sea. They, they were, the Irrawaddy River, which is the biggest one, and as big as the Mississippi River. This, this all took place so many years ago, and you, you people could really realize that. But when you get to talk with some of the people over there, if they open up a little, you'll be you, you, you surprised the conditions of it. And the same was true in the in the South Pacific, too. We had to take all those islands one by one, and they, the Japanese were entrenched in there. Very difficult to, you know. These movies that you've seen, they depict pretty much like it was. Maybe sometimes a little overdone, maybe. But uh, it, it's, uh, there's documentary film now available. Captured film, also documentary of the, of the event that was taken at the time. You can. Whoever see those had a chance to watch them on the History Channel or something like that, it, it tells you like it was. And then, of course, all the wars that took place since then, a lot of things that are worse than that. Anybody else? These kids are saturated by the now. Well, uh, Wednesday, uh, Ann was talking about being on the ground in Burma. Wednesday, we have Steve Holly coming in. Our former assemblyman, so that's where he spent his entire military career in the Pacific, underground in Burma, with the mule artillery. Hey. Uh, they, that's the you, you can't take. move it by a uh, mechanized vehicle, so you hook mules up and haul the artillery up and down the mountains in Burma. And uh, he can explain a little bit about that. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, I don't know whether we have any other speakers lined up this semester. I'm working on uh, for our former congressman, John Conable, uh, Barbara Conable, and his brother, John, uh, who was a Wyoming County judge. I don't know whether we'll have this semester or not. Uh, both of those men fought in the Pacific. Uh, the congressman was a Marine Lieutenant at Iwo Jima. And I talked to the John Conable's son-in-law, Mark Gaper, who teaches here. And he said he's been helping John with his memoirs. He was one of the first Americans back into the Philippines with MacArthur. You know. So, yeah, you know, we're trying to trying to get some of these people to, to tell the stories. Uh, you know, we saw Sid Sherwin. Uh, that's unique because here's a man who was on the Oklahoma has a big torpedo behind him at Pearl Harbor. Uh, in a few more years, we're not going to have anybody to talk about this anymore. And you don't realize the horrors of war unless you can talk to people like Mr. Hamilton here. Uh, how would your golf game? You shooting your age yet? I think. I think. Nice. Uh, yeah, Hamilton's been out uh, shooting his age. Golf. Yeah. Uh, well, we won't tell you how old. But he, he still shoots uh, very close to the top. Well, anyway, I'll be in